All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to our Luke Acts class, Luke Acts for Beginners. This is lesson number nine in this series, title of this uh, section that we'll be um, going over today, Jesus Faces Jerusalem, part four. And we'll be doing Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to uh, chapter 18, verse 30. Well, I think it'd be good at this point to review our outline for Luke's gospel so that we can you know, situate today's lesson in the context of the entire book. In other words, uh, where are we at exactly in our study? So we're right here, the five, five elements in uh, the outline, the beginning, Jesus in Galilee, Jesus facing Jerusalem, Jesus entering Jerusalem, and then the consummation. So we're right in the middle there, Jesus facing Jerusalem. So in our last lesson, Jesus was giving instructions to His disciples concerning a variety of topics pursuant to the life of discipleship. In today's lesson, we're going to finish with the events taking place as Jesus slowly makes His way toward the outskirts and eventually into the city of Jerusalem itself. Luke notes this fact as he prefaces the encounters with various people along the way with a reminder of where Jesus and the apostles are. In Luke 17, verse 11, he says, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And so we are going to pick up the story there. Read chapter 12, excuse me, chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Uh, Luke writes, as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. A Little bit about leprosy here. Leprosy is an ancient disease mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments from a Greek word meaning a fish scale or to peel. Uh, it was uh, what we refer to as Hansen's disease a term given to this disease in 1873 after the doctor who discovered that it was caused by a bacterium that attacked the nervous system. People with uh, leprosy experience disfigurement of the skin and bones, the twisting of the limbs and the curling of the fingers, which eventually forms a, a claw-like hand. The largest number of deformities that these uh, people uh, suffer are actually the result of accidents uh, and injuries that occur because lepers eventually lose the ability to feel pain due to extensive nerve damage. So the nerves are so damaged they can't, they can't experience pain. So inattentive sufferers can cut themselves or grasp a cup of boiling water without any sensation of pain. Uh, leprosy like tuberculosis to which it is related is highly contagious and spread by skin contact or contact with nasal or other secretions by the affected person. Uh, even though all of this was not known scientifically in New Testament times, lepers were still separated from the general population and were already considered as dead for religious purposes. Contact with them rendered one unclean and that person had to undergo a purification process before he or she could return to normal social interaction and more specifically worship at the temple. Lepers had to live outside the towns and villages in makeshift shelters and this probably explains why these men that cried out to Jesus on his way into the village, they were outside the village. Notice uh, what it is that they ask for. They don't ask for alms or money, they ask for mercy. They were forced to live outside of society, but they knew what was going on inside of society. Unlike those who had access to Jesus, like the priests and the lawyers and the normal Jews, who were able to debate His claims, and uh, many of them, of course, refused to believe Him, these sad and desperate men, knowing what he had done for others appealed to him for mercy. In other words, they appealed to him for healing. So we read verse 14, it says, when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. So the instruction to go see the priest was the proper procedure for one who had been healed uh, or there was remission of the disease, the disease that was uh, taking place. 
In uh, Luke, I'll go back here, chapter five, verse 14, uh, Luke writes, and he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. So in, in Luke 5 here, we have the description of the procedure that they needed to undergo so that the priest could confirm that their healing was legitimate and thus they could re-enter normal society and public worship in the synagogue and more importantly, as I said, be able to go to the temple. Now, the amazing thing here is that the lepers had to begin moving towards the temple where the priests were before the leprosy was healed. Only when they made the move to go was the leprosy taken away from them, not before. Had they just sat there and went, oh yeah, sure, nothing would have happened. So they cried out in faith and He answered by giving them a test of faith. Now we know Jesus can heal or save without a test of faith because He knows you know, if we believe or not in our, in our hearts. The test of faith, however, served two very important purposes. First of all, it focused and confirmed in the minds of the lepers who and how this miracle was done. Healing came based on their faith in Jesus. And secondly, the test demonstrated that living faith, you know, the kind of faith that heals, that saves, that serves, living faith is seen in action and not simply assent. You know, in James chapter 2, verse 18, James says, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. So I believe and I express that belief with action. So let's go back to our passage and continue reading. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. So there were 10 lepers. One of them was a Samaritan. Apparently the division between Jew and Samaritan was forgotten as they shared a common a disease. Of the ten, only the Samaritan returns to first give thanks to Jesus before going to the priests for confirmation and reestablishment. Now, the way he does so indicates not only his gratitude, but his attitude toward Jesus, one of reverence and one of uh, devotion. Putting off his social redemption in order to thank and pray homage to, uh, to Jesus. Yeah, it must have been hard to stop and turn around. I'm on my way to my new life, you know, to stop and go back and say thanks. Jesus states the obvious. Where are the others, he says? Has only this Samaritan come and to give thanks? In responding to the Samaritan uh, leper's demonstration of gratitude and honor, the Lord says something about this one person and also it says something about the nine who did not come. First of all, the nine asked for and received the healing and were on the road to social acceptance and a normal life. The Samaritan, however, asked for and received the healing, but because of his response to Jesus, was not only on the road to physical normalcy, but also on the way of faith that would ultimately give him eternal life. So this scene also serves as a kind of a living prophecy concerning how the gospel will be accepted by both Jews and Gentiles. The nine Jews, the, the leprous Jews, they represent the blessings and opportunities that the Jewish nation had in receiving Jesus as their Messiah. And yet, despite the law, the prophets, the temple, the miracles, and that Jesus was one of them, they rejected Him. Like the nine of the ten lepers simply did not say thank you and went away. The lone Samaritan represents the Gentiles who despite the odds, and there were odds, you know, believing in a foreign savior from a people who despised them, despite these odds, uh, this individual nevertheless embraced Christianity and this looked forward to the time where 
the ones, you know, the majority, the Jews, would reject Christ and the minority at that time anyways, the Gentiles, who didn't have much of a chance, you know, they would accept Christ. So this living parable points not only to the rejection that the Jews, or that Jesus rather, will soon face in Jerusalem, but the eventual rejection by the Jews and acceptance by the Gentiles to come in the decades and centuries to follow. Uh, a living parable, all right? Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about the second coming now, or Jesus rather talks about the second coming. Both Matthew and Mark record Jesus' teaching on the last days. This teaching is brought up by the question of the Pharisees. So let's go to Luke 17, jump ahead here to verse 20. It says, now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. So these people here, these Pharisees, had witnessed miracles and they knew that the Messiah would be revealed by great power and miracles. But they did not see the signs of the kingdom that was also to appear when the Messiah came. In other words, they were expecting certain other signs. For example, renewed political power and freedom from Roman domination and economic prosperity. And so their question had a certain tone to it. Let's, you know, let, me, let me phrase the question in the tone that it was asked. If you're the Messiah, where is, when is your kingdom supposed to arrive? See the difference there? If you're, if you're this big Messiah guy, you know, woo, miracles and everything, where's the economic prosperity? How come we're still slaves to the Romans? And, uh, why aren't we you know, uh, uh, a rising kingdom, you know, a rising dominant kingdom? That, that was what was behind the, the question. You know, where is your kingdom? So Jesus tells them that the kingdom cannot be seen according to their physical criteria. However, it was already among them, embodied in Himself and His disciples. They didn't see that, of course. But He tells them that's the truth. In, verse 22, in verses 22 to 37, Jesus provides another proof of His divinity and legitimacy as the Messiah by prophesying concerning the manner and by whose hand His death will occur and the subsequent destruction of the nation, but some 40 years down the line. You want to know about the kingdom, Jesus says? I'll tell you about the kingdom, but before that happens, these things are going to happen. So he also answers their question about the arrival of the kingdom. Let's go ahead, verse 23 and 4. It says, they will say to you, look there, look here, do not go away and do not run after them. For just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in His day. So they were asking for recognizable signs of the kingdom, thinking that the kingdom would be a local, cultural, and political event. Jesus responds that when the kingdom, meaning the fulfillment of the kingdom at the end of the world, at His return, not the arrival of the kingdom, which had already taken place with His first appearance, which they had, by the way, rejected, and so when the fulfillment came, you know, at the end of the world, no one could and no one would miss it. He says to them, in effect, you won't have to look for it, just like you don't have to search for lightning when it strikes. It's obvious to everybody. When lightning strikes, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to be looking for it. It's pretty obvious. And verses 25, in verse 25, just want to read that. He says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So in verse 25, Jesus not only prophesies about his own death, but he provides the reason that these Jews missed the coming of the kingdom. They rejected their king. The king of the kingdom came and they rejected him. That's why they didn't see the kingdom. So in the rest of this passage, verses 26 down to 37, I'm not going to read that, Jesus contrasts believers and non-believers and what happens when the kingdom is fulfilled at the judgment. Basically, He says one is taken to heaven with Jesus 
and one is left to face judgment. Here I might note this talk about rapture. There is no rapture in the sense that you know, modern books and, and Hollywood in certain movies have displayed it. There is no rapture you know, with pots left boiling on stoves or empty cars on the highways because these people have been miraculously whisked away while others are left here on earth to continue you know, the big traffic jam. These verses are simply a warning that along with the kingdom at its fulfillment also comes a judgment. And that judgment will separate those who will be in that kingdom and those who won't. One will be taken for the kingdom and one will be left for what? For judgment. The apostles, of course, still not clear on the matter, ask where this will happen. And Jesus, uh, Jesus answers, we skip down to verse 37, He says, in answering they said to Him, where Lord? You know, where is this all going to happen? And He said to them, where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. So the judgment, He says, is not a matter of where, but of what? The dead, the unbelievers, are destroyed. You know, the, the idea of vultures, you know, that's hell and, and destruction. There's not where, you know, where geographically, it's what's going to happen. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. And so he moves on from there to parables about prayer. In verse eight, or chapter 18, verse 1, he says, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. So you know, after the teaching on the kingdom and the dire warnings using language they couldn't quite understand, not to mention Jesus predicting His own imminent death, His disciples are in need of some encouragement and the Lord provides it in the form of teaching on prayer. These parables did not provide instructions you know, on the words to use or the topics to pray for, but rather the attitudes that individuals should have in order to pray successfully. And success in prayer is that you receive an answer of some kind. So these two parables, and then there's an epilogue, they describe three attitudes necessary to succeed in prayer. So the first attitude to succeed is perseverance. So let's begin reading in Luke chapter 18, verse two. In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God, did not respect man. There was a widow in that city and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for His elect who cry to Him day and night? And will He delay long over them? I tell you that He will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on earth? So this parable is not about the qualifications of judges and how they should you know, help those in need. There's only one point here to the parable and that is persistence pays off. Persistent pays off in prayer, uh, in a lot of other things in life, but especially in prayer. Jesus' question at the end is an admonition to those in the future. Will believers continue to pray even to the end when I return, he asks. And he leaves the answer, of course, to that question up to every generation that reads this parable, including our own. Now, the second attitude necessary to succeed in prayer, according to Jesus, humility. So let's read, beginning in verse nine. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went up to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, 
but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, interestingly, this parable is unique to Luke's gospel. Only, you only see it here. Uh, the story is easy enough to understand because the characters are boldly drawn. One is proud, self-sufficient, rather arrogant. The other was penitent, sincere, and humble. The humble man, like the poor widow in the previous parable, receives a reward as a result of his attitude in prayer. Uh, his prayer was not based on how long it was or the style that it was, but the fact that he had a humble attitude in offering. So those who persist in humble prayer, you know, the action and the attitude, they'll succeed. God will hear their prayers. God will answer their prayers. Then a third attitude is innocence. Innocence. Um, the third lesson on prayer is not given as a parable, but as the detailed information about Jesus' busy uh, public ministry. So let's read 15 to 17. It says, and they were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them saying, permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. So the scene supplies one other attitude for successful prayer and that's innocence. Not innocence because we have no sin. Innocence in that our hearts and our minds are free from self-justification and blame and pretentious words and arguments, much like children. Prayers like this, prayers by people like this who pray them are heard, Jesus says, because these are the people in prayers that populate the kingdom of heaven. This leads us to the parable of the rich young ruler. So let's move ahead. Uh, verse uh, 18 to uh, 27, it says, A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, the, thing, uh, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. So both Mark and Matthew include this parable about not only the importance of becoming a disciple, but the high cost of, um, of doing so. I want you to note that Jesus is not adding a requirement here to becoming a disciple. In other words, he's not saying, OK, if you want to be my disciple, you have to sell all your stuff. You have to give away all your things, your goods and your wealth. We know that this is not so because in every other instance where people are obeying the gospel, this requirement is never mentioned. I mean, just take Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 38 and, and following, where 3,000 people are baptized, become Jesus' disciple. There are no instructions there for them to give up their worldly goods. And in every other description, all the way through the New Testament, you never see that admonition to anyone to sell their goods in order to become a disciple. However, for this particular man, giving away his wealth was necessary because it was getting in the way of what he wanted. He wanted assurance that he was perfect or acceptable before God. You know, in Matthew 19, 21, it says, Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, if you wish to be perfect, he had relied on his wealth and position as security that he was acceptable before God. And the reason for that is that at that time, the Jews believed that personal wealth was a definite sign that God favored you over others. And if you were poor, well, there was something wrong with you. And yet, despite having it all, this man did not feel acceptable or perfect 
or secure in his spirit. So he comes to Jesus to find out what he needed to add. What must I do? What must I add? Is there a rule? Is there an insight? Is there a practice? Is there a ritual in order to be absolutely sure? And so Jesus surprises him by telling him that if he wanted completeness or wholeness or assurance, he needed to remove something, not add something. He needed to remove the wealth that was blocking him from depending completely on Jesus for his salvation, his righteousness, and his assurance. The fact that he refused shows how completely trapped he was in his wealth. I mean, it owned him. He did not own it. That's the thing about wealth. You can have as much money as you want. You can have 10 houses if you want. The, the, the idea, and, and still be a faithful Christian. The idea is make sure that you own the stuff. It doesn't own you. So Jesus uses this scene to warn His disciples about the limiting of spiritual vision and life caused by worldliness and the pursuit of wealth. And he says it, it's hard for a rich person to go to heaven because amassing wealth does certain things. First of all, it takes up most of our time and attention. You got, if you have a lot of money and if you have a business that creates a lot of money, you have to invest a whole lot of time into that to maintain it, to hang on to it. Time you know, that is often taken away from family, from spiritual pursuits. Secondly, Often money tempts us to compromise what is good and right for what is profitable. You know how many business owners or how many people with a lot of wealth uh, are forced to compromise what they feel is, is the right thing to do because in doing so will make them less wealthy. And thirdly, Wealth draws us towards people who also love and seek wealth. And usually those kind of people, you know, in general, not usually very, very devout Christians. In my own experience, I've known many, many wealthy people, but only a few of them who were Christians were devoutly so. So needless to say, none of these things promote spiritual vision or practice because we are continually focused on shiny new and expensive things here below, not the things of light that are from above. And I think you know, people learn that lesson, you know, the rich young ruler, because I do read about very, very rich men who may not have faith. I, there's no, you know, I don't know them personally, I know what kind of people they are, if they're a faith or not, but the lesson that they learn is that the, the, the key to happiness for them, despite their enormous wealth, and I don't mean I have a million dollars in the bank, I'm talking about billionaires, okay? One thing I've noticed about these people is they find happiness when they discover that giving away their fortune is much more edifying than amassing more. And many of them have stated publicly that their goal is to give away the majority of their wealth during their lifetime. And that is a, a, marvelous, a marvelous thing uh, for the world and also for, their, uh, for those people, absolutely. Unfortunately, a, a moment comes, like the young man here who came to Jesus, where people have to choose God or wealth. And for those who love money, the choice is always, well, it's always money. So in, in verse uh, 28 to 30, uh, Peter said, Behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is none who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. So Peter's question permits Jesus to reassure his disciples that whatever they have given up in order to follow him will be returned to them in abundance along with the eternal life sought after by the rich young ruler. He does not give any details here, but I think each one of us who have come to Christ as adults or from another faith can vouch for what he has just said. You know, in my life, my, my you know, paternal family, you know, my physical family, my bio family, to this day won't have much to do with me since leaving the Roman Catholic religion. However, I can't even number the number of homes of brothers and sisters in Christ in this country and other countries 
where Lees and I would be warmly welcomed as Christian family. You know, a hundredfold, pff, a thousandfold. And so uh, the wealthy have much to enjoy and look forward to in this world as they watch their riches grow and contemplate the things that these will buy and enable them to do. Yes, the, the idea that the rich are not having any fun or they're not happy, not true. <laughs> they are happy, they are having a good time. Why? They're contemplating the things that they're going to buy and the things they're going to do and they're free from monetary worry. So those are good things. However, uh, Jesus, on the other hand, He offers the reward of Christian fellowship and ministry in this world and eternal life in the next. And of course, we all know that's something that money cannot buy. Okay, so there's the section uh, up to um, Luke um, 18, and our assignment for next time will be Luke 18, 31 to 1948. Luke packs in a lot of information in his uh, gospel, that's why we're kind of moving uh, rather quickly uh, through it to make sure that we're, we're touching on all the important subjects. All right, thank you very much, we'll see you next time.